Thank you, Aliska. Uh, let me start by quickly uh, guiding you through the agenda for the next 30 minutes. Uh, so I want to briefly discuss Exxon and Exonic, what they are, what the timeline is, what the difference is between the company and the framework, just to set that straight. Um, and then the bulk of my presentation will be about why you would use Exxon. Uh, if you're a manager here and, and one of your um, uh, developers has pointed you to this webinar, you may have heard that Exxon is being used in your organization, uh, but why exactly would they do that? That's what I'm trying to explain there, and I'm going to do that by relating Exxon to two uh, major industry trends, which transcends individual platform technology like Exxon. Um, after we've seen the why, I want to show you a little bit about the Exxon architecture, uh, discussing the how, how can Exxon provide the benefits that we will claim it provides. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to show you a couple of cases of customers successfully using Exxon in production. Um, so first, a little bit of history. Uh, if you look at Exxon framework, uh, development started in 2010, so a long time ago. Uh, so the good news is that Exxon is not some kind of weird experimental technology. Uh, this is tried and tested. Uh, the concepts that went into Exxon are actually a lot older. So the core concepts are CQRS, event sourcing, or ES, and uh, domain-driven design. I'm going to talk about these in a little bit more detail uh, later. Uh, but for now, the key thing is that these have been around for a long time. Uh, so these concepts went into Exxon Framework, uh, developed by Ex by Alad Bauser, our, our founder and, and CTO, and CQRS was one of the core use cases then. Uh, so Exxon Framework for quite a long time was kind of like a hobby, uh, was used a little bit, a little bit in production, but didn't really become big. Uh, and then in 2014 and 2015, microservices suddenly became a big thing. Everybody started to talk about that. Um, and that was also the moment when Exxon started to grow really fast. So here we see a chart of the downloads uh, per month. Uh, they're growing exponentially. Uh, we hit about 100,000 downloads per month by the end of last uh, year, uh, and we're even further now. Um, and that mainly has to do with this microservices trend. Uh, so Exxon was not designed for microservices because that would be impossible given the timeline. Uh, but people were rediscovering these old concepts in the context of microservices and found out that they were really useful there. And we'll be talking a lot more about microservices later on. Now, since uh, Exxon was growing so fast, uh, there was an increasing demand for Exxon services, uh, and it made sense to start thinking about more advanced Exxon products to complement the open source framework. And that was the reason for founding Exonic. So Exonic is the company now supporting Exxon Framework. Uh, this happened uh, mid of 2017, uh, so about 19 months ago by now. Um, Exonic didn't appear out of thin air. Uh, it's part of a family of companies. Uh, specifically, Exonic uh, split out of uh, Trifork Amsterdam. So the founder of, uh, of Exonic was previously employed by Trifork Amsterdam, and that's where Exxon Framework was uh, managed. Um, so it became an independent company of 2000, in 2017. Uh, and it wasn't the first company to spring out of Trifork and its predecessor. So uh, another one that you may have heard of is Elastic, which uh, split out of uh, uh, Trifork in 2012. And an even older one uh, is uh, Spring, which was later acquired by Pivotal. So very successful, uh, now pretty famous companies in the Java world. Um, and we hope and expect that Exonic will be uh, in a similar position a couple of years from now. Um, looking at where we are today, we're not elastic yet. Uh, we are about 15 employees and growing rapidly. Our headquarters are in the Netherlands. Um, and we also have uh, a sizable uh, department in Serbia. We're growing that rapidly to provide consulting services from there. Um, what we sell is basically two things. So one area is all kinds of services, training, support, uh, consultancy, uh, remote developments. Uh, and the other part is commercial software. So Exxon Framework itself is open source. But we sell a bunch of add-ons to that, including Exxon Server, uh, which we'll be discussing uh, later on. Uh, as well as the GDPR module for encryption. We're not going to discuss that today, uh, but you can find some material on the internet if you're interested in that one. That's all I wanted to share about the history. Um, 
Now let's look at buy Exxon. Uh, I'm going to um, relate that to two major industry trends, but before I mention those trends, let's look at a little bit of context. So if you look at the general business context of today, what we're seeing is that most CEOs are focused on growth, obviously, in a, in a commercial organization. Um, but more specifically, they expect that this growth is coming from digital business growth. So not general business growth, but they're expecting the growth to come from the digital parts of the business or by moving existing non-digital parts of the business to the digital world. Uh, and this drives this need for uh, what they call digital transformation. It's a bit of a buzzword nowadays, but I think it actually does mean something. It means that you're using IT not just to do some automation of existing stuff to make it a little bit more efficient. Or, and it's not about just putting some kind of web front end uh, to have some self-service for processes that were previously done uh, through humans. But it's really about changing the business, by having new uh, business processes, seizing new possibilities, offering things that weren't uh, possible before. Um, and while I'm, sh I'm sketching the context here from a, from a commercial organization perspective where you're looking at growth and profit, of course, many of these things also definitely apply to not-for-profit organizations. We're also looking at new ways to provide their services, new ways to engage their audiences. Um, now, what this entire uh, context of digital transformation means is that it's a set of new requirements for your IT. Uh, to put it very simply, if you, if you have this idea of a new business process where you respond in real time to events to make some kind of offer to your users, then this is not going to work if your IT is still batch oriented and all you can do is process things during the night. So your IT needs to support these kinds of things. So um, uh, the, the things sketched in these contexts should really influence all major IT decisions. Um, and in this context, there are two trends I want to discuss. So first one is microservices. I mentioned that before already in the timeline. Um, so if you look at what the microservices idea is, it's actually really simple. It's, it's about splitting up a system into smaller units in such a way that these smaller units, the microservices, can be maintained and deployed independently uh, if needed by separate teams. Uh, and it's often positioned as the opposite of a monolithical architecture. So people are looking to migrate from the monolith to microservices. Um, if you remember last decade's uh, service-oriented architecture trends, you may think that this is very similar, and that's correct. It is very similar. It's just done better. It's, it's service-oriented architecture with lessons learned, with, with more focus on autonomy, with more focus on, on being lightweight. Um, so that's microservices. So now that we know what it is, the big question, I guess, is why would you do that? Why would you split your system into these small units? And I think there are two main reasons why you should consider this. So one is agility. Uh, if you have small services, then the deployment cycle can be short. It doesn't take weeks to deploy a new version of an individual microservices. Uh, this also really neatly aligns with DevOps methodologies, which many companies have adopted and which really try to uh, shoot for the same goal. Uh, and the result of that is that you have faster time to market, which is, of course, really important if you expect uh, your digital business to fuel growth in your company. Um, and the other thing is scalability. So if you have split your system into many microservices, you can scale the number of instances of a particular microservices as needed to, uh, uh, to enable higher throughput. Um, this idea in turn fits really well with all these modern stable cloud platforms like Pivotal Cloud Foundry, uh, Kubernetes, uh, OpenShift, etc. cetera, um, which means that uh, as a result, you know, you can be sure that your IT systems can actually keep up with business growth, which again is relevant if you uh, are shooting for this uh, digital growth. So microservices is a relatively easy phenomenon. It's, it's difficult to implement, but um, uh, as a phenomenon, it's about splitting up your uh, monoliths uh, to have enhanced agility and scalability. Um, second trend I want to discuss is event-driven architecture, or also called EDA. Uh, that's a little bit more complex. I'm going to spend some more time discussing this. On a higher level, the idea is to make your IT event-centric as opposed to data-centric. And that may sound a little bit vague, but what that means is that you know, an event is something that has happened. 
uh, and data generally describes the current state of affairs. So I have a small example here. Uh, data about me, about Frans, could be Frans lives in Montfort, the Netherlands, which is true. Uh, it's data, it's the current state of affairs. Um, uh, the relevant event here is that Frans moved to Montfort. Previously, I used to live somewhere else uh, in December of 2014. So IT systems could deal with both. Uh, Event-driven systems deal with the second type of data. So these traditional IT systems typically consist of, of transactions, uh, so they, they process data, do, do CRUD operations on data. Uh, Event-driven systems process events and produce new events if things occur. Uh, importantly, with these EDA-based systems, uh, event processing is assumed to take place in real time. You don't do nightly batches, you process events in streams as they come in, totally continuously. So that's event-driven architecture. Um, again, it's good to ask, why would you do this? Um, and there are actually many reasons, too, too, uh, too many to all discuss in this webinar. Uh, they all have to do with growth. So generally, there's a very strong connection between event-driven architecture and business growth. And I want to zoom into three of those connections in particular. Um, the first one is through modern technology. Uh, there are many uh, new exciting technologies that have become available in the past few years uh, that can help you achieve growth. Uh, some examples there are blockchain, you've all heard of that, you know, the Internet of Things, uh, there's machine learning. Now, if we look at these technologies, then blockchain is essentially a distributed ledger of events. Uh, the Internet of Things is about having many things out there that are producing a stream of events. If you look at machine learning, of course, first have to do the learning before you can reap the benefits. And the learning is fueled by a past set of events. So events is the, is the common denominator between all these technologies. And unless you are adopting some level of EDA, you cannot use these technologies at all. So they're a prerequisite to using these other technologies that can then uh, re provide you with benefits to establish business growth. So that's one strong reason why you would do EDA. Um, a second one uh, is the idea of business moments. So business moments is a concept that's really relevant to, uh, def to define these new business concepts that help you uh, get real growth and to, do, to develop true new uh, business models. And what these are, these moments, they are short-lived business opportunities. So uh, a classic example is that a traveler exits an airplane he's at uh, the airfield. Uh, he's not there at the airfield to stay. So he may very well be interested in transport, out of the airport, public transport, a taxi, uh, maybe a hotel, anything like that. Um, and if you want to do something commercially with that, uh, with that moment, you need to act immediately. An hour from that event, uh, you will have solved these problems in another way. So you need to react immediately. Um, another example could be if I, um, uh, if I move to another house. There may be all kinds of services that are associated with someone who has just moved to another house. Uh, but two months from then, I will have settled in a new house and all will be done. So there are these business moments that if you can capture them and can react to them in real time, uh, can really enable new kinds of business models. But the only way you can do that in your T systems is if they're desi designed for real-time event processing. Uh, traditional data-centric systems will have a real difficult time doing anything useful with this. A third, third link between EDA and uh, growth uh, is through application modernization. So if you look at that digital transformation idea, uh, it requires fundamental changes to your application portfolios. Um, but most companies will need to do that while keeping the business running. Almost no one has the luxury of developing something into a greenfield. Uh, so you cannot do a big bang there. You're going to have a very long time where you're going to have these new systems supporting the new world uh, and legacy systems as well. They will coexist. So how are you going to integrate those? And this is again something that's really relatively easy to do with EDA. Uh, because if you have events, you have a really nice interface between these new and old worlds. You can keep uh, old systems up to date 
in response to events produced by the new world, for instance, or the other way around. You have also a really nice way to integrate uh, with business partners outside of your own company. Um, so EDA very strongly supports all kinds of integration, which then supports uh, a gradual modernization of your application portfolio, which is an essential ingredient in digital transformation. Um, so many reasons why EDA fuels growth. So, so far I've, I've, I've uh, been uh, discussing many positive factors uh, of both trends, and there are, but there are also a lot of risks. Uh, so if you're using microservices and EDA, uh, you're introducing some complexity. Uh, there's a risk that you're getting the complexity but not getting the benefits. Uh, there's a risk, a very real risk, that teams will spend all their energy looking at the technologies associated with these things rather than actually looking at the sensible application of these things uh, from a business perspective. Uh, there's the uh, reinventing the wheel, their own frameworks, uh, unpredictable timelines. Uh, so there are great potential benefits but also significant risks if you embark on projects using these concepts. Now this is where Exxon comes in. Uh, if you look at a very high level why you would use Exxon, then uh, Exxon allows you to build applications following these two trends, microservices and EDA. And specifically, Exxon enables you to do that on the, on, in the Java world, so using the Java or Kotlin programming languages. Uh, it allows you to build these applications while just focusing on the business logic and the business domain. So all infrastructure aspects, uh, are handled by Exxon. All the generic code that developers tend to call a boilerplate code is all handled by Exxon. So you can really purely focus on the business logic where you can really make a difference. Um, and doing so, uh, teams can reap the benefits of microservices and EDA uh, at minimal investment and risk. That's, that's the story. So if all you remember from this presentation is one slide, then this would be a really good candidate. This is the core of the story. Now, to go one level deeper, you may be interested to learn how we can do this. So for that purpose, we need to look into the Exxon architecture. Um, Exxon consists of two components. So there's Exxon Framework and there's Exxon Server. Exxon Framework is a free and open source framework. Now, Exxon Server is an optional component, so you can use Exxon without Server. Um, but it does make it a lot easier to scale out Exxon applications. It's free in a non-clustered form, and there's a paid enterprise version for critical deployments available as well. Um, looking at the core patterns in Exxon Framework, there are DDD, domain-driven design. Uh, domain-driven design is something you could talk for a couple of days, but to summarize it in a couple of seconds, um, the idea is that the structure of software should reflect the structure of the real world. And in particular, events in the program should be events in the business. So if you're going to do event-driven architecture and the developers are defining their own events uh, and the business cannot understand what these events mean, uh, then you're doing it wrong. Those events should uh, match the business and that's, that's one of the core ideas behind domain-driven design. Uh, second core pattern in Exxon Framework is CQRS. Um, again, something you could talk about for a long time, but the essence is that you can create so-called read models derived from your primary storage. Um, and the relevance of that idea here in this EDA context is that uh, even though we have an event-driven system, in many cases you do need to be able to look up the current state. That's the core feature of, um, uh, of many IT systems. Uh, so deriving this current state from the stream of events uh, and then making that accessible for queries, uh, that's something that's enabled by the CQRS core pattern. Third pattern in Exxon Framework is event sourcing. Event sourcing is kind of like EDA. It's, it's actually a radical form of event-driven architecture where you don't say, I have events and they're, they're flowing around. But I'm saying all my storage, all my primary storage is actually just a series of events and nothing else. Uh, and that's in a way the simplest way to do EDA because you don't have anything else and you don't have to think about producing events in addition to changing your data because all that you have is events. A very big benefit that's driving companies to adopt this is that you get full auditability. If all, 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 the only way that you can store your state is through events, then no state can ever change without this being auditable. 
which is a great benefit in many contexts. So Axon Framework implements these three core patterns. They're uh, essential implementation patterns for effective event-driven architecture. They are hard to implement from scratch. They're very easy to implement with Axon Framework. That's what Axon Framework does for those, uh, for those major trends that we saw. Looking at the other part of the, of the Axon platform, Axon Server, um, the core functionality is routing. So it's routing of messages between components. Uh, this allows you to split microservices at very minimal effort because you don't have to worry about the routing. Axon Server will do that. The other thing it does is offer an event store, which is like a database specifically for events. Uh, and the key benefit here is that this eliminates scalability issues associated with traditional databases. If you have a traditional SQL database and you put a billion events in it, uh, the performance will crumble because it has not been designed to have that kind of load. Uh, the event store will function as efficiently as if it had just a thousand events. It just doesn't matter because it has been designed for that specific purpose. Um, of these two functionalities, I think the routing one is the most strategic one. Uh, this is directly related to this microservice trend. Um, microservices are great for agility and scalability, but also introduce risk. Uh, introduce a lot of additional work to create all kinds of interfaces and consume those interfaces. What you can do with Axon Server and its routing functionality is to adopt an evolutionary approach to microservices. So you start writing a monolith and then you split it up. You have the option to split it up as needed and that can be done in minutes. And we actually do that live on stage many times, just in the last five minutes of a presentation, transform a monolith into a microservices system. Um, that by itself is very valuable. It also eliminates a lot of integration code, which doesn't have to be written and maintained. And actually, in, when we do the financial business case for customers for Axon Server, this is what drives it. So simply by the number of hours of development hours that you don't have to spend on writing integration code, you can very easily afford an Axon Server enterprise license. Um, and this elim eliminates many risks, many of the technology risks usually associated with microservices. So to summarize, Axon, the complete Axon platform consisting of the framework and the server, uh, provides the building blocks for worry-free implementation of event-driven architecture and microservices. And we've seen how EDA microservices have great benefits in and by themselves. Uh, looking at some cases. Uh, we have many reference cases on YouTube, so I'm not going to discuss them all in a lot of detail here. Uh, you can go to YouTube and then subscribe to the Exonic channel. If you don't subscribe, you cannot see all the videos, so you should press uh, subscribe. And then you will find two lists. So the most recent one is the playlist Exonic Conference 2018. Uh, there you will find presentations by Toyota, Barclay Card, Ferratum, uh, MN, and Blox. Uh, and then there's also a playlist called Projects with Exxon Framework, which is from our 2017 conference, where you will again see Barclay Card, but also uh, Promontech, uh, Societe Generale, uh, Wangini, Geromedica, and, uh, and Adpa. So many cases presented by the users themselves uh, that you may, uh, may look at. Um, I want to briefly touch upon three of those that are in that list, because I think they're really interesting. Uh, so one is uh, Promontech. Uh, Promontech is a white label mortgage tech company from Denver, so their customers are major banks uh, that issue loans. They have they, they did have the luxury of a greenfield and built their core platform using Axon. If you look at what drives this, uh, they have mortgages, a very complex business domain, very complex rules. Uh, they wanted to implement efficient workflows, prevent uh, double work, double entry of data. Uh, auditability is very important. Uh, adequate business information, reporting, uh, in all kinds of formats is really important. Um, so it made a lot of sense to them to choose an event-driven architecture, specifically CQRS and event, event sourcing. And then they found that Axon provides an implementation of these things in Java that prevents reinventing the wheel. So this is what's driving that case. And do have a look at that presentation by Promontex Michael Kazarian, uh, which is really great. It's on our YouTube. Um, second one is Barclays. Uh, so Exxon is used by Barclays in the U.S. You may, bar, you know, you may know Barclays as a U.K. Uh, bank where it's really old. Uh, their U U.S. branch is a lot, is a lot uh, younger. Um, they started out with Exxon by building uh, a, a new 
uh, uh, business initiative on Exxon, which was consumer lending. Uh, at that point, they were already doing credit card business, but that was not on uh, Exxon. And then after they did consumer lending, they started migrating their existing credit card business from their monoliths uh, to the new Exxon uh, platform. So this is really a case about microservices uh, and getting an increased uh, agility, which is really needed uh, in the market there. Um, third one I want to mention is uh, Toyota, specifically Toyota Motor Europe. They're using Exxon for multiple systems, but uh, the presentation that you can view on our YouTube is about uh, the engagement hub, which is a really interesting system. So this is about marketing. It's an event-centric approach to marketing. They have many potential use cases for the platform, but the initial use case is order tracking. So this is between the moment that someone has bought a new Toyota, has ordered it, and the moment that they actually get it delivered. Uh, during that phase, uh, they can send all kinds of updates uh, to that user uh, to keep them engaged uh, as a customer of, of Toyota. Um, this, of course, needs many integration points with all kinds of sales systems, with, uh, with the factories that have the updates on the production process. Um, if you relate this to what we previously discussed, this is a really good example of that stuff about business moments. They have identified interesting business moments, and by updating uh, the customers uh, in an adequate way at that point, rather than sending them general marketing spam, they are very much improving customer engagement, which creates new sales channels. Uh, they are sending emails that will be opened by customers because they are relevant to that customer. That means that you can make them new offers as well, uh, and they have great plans to further uh, leverage this platform in the future. Um, that's it for now. Um, so we can take a few questions, Liska.